instance. Just ask uh, medicine, no, whether they're saying it. Yes, They'll be saying no medicine. Okay, so uh, today no, we'll be looking at the and <clears throat> anticoagulation therapy in uh, use of anticoagulation therapy in ischemic strokes and TIS. What are the uh, modifications which has been made in the older indication and what are the newer indication for anticoagulation? So we'll address this in the following three practically relevant uh, subheadings. Uh, who are the patient who will benefit with the uh, anticoagulation and what anticoagulation we need to start and when we should start following a stroke and TIA. So before we start, uh, we'll just look at some very basic, uh, just to brush up the uh, pharmacology. So we like to look at the mechanisms of action to understand these uh, drugs better. So as all of you know, we have the intrinsic and the extrinsic system, which finally culminates in the activation of uh, factor 10 to factor 10A. So that's the common. After that, we have a common pathway. Now, if you look at uh, the newer oral anticoagulant, uh, sorry, and uh, finally the factor 10, activated factor 10 will convert uh, prothrombin to thrombin, which finally will convert fibrin, fibrinogen to fibrin and which forms the meshwork. So this is in a nutshell, the uh, coagulation cascade. So we'll see where each of these uh, drugs will fit into this. So first we have the direct thrombin inhibitors, the newer anticoagulants, DTIs. And uh, these are, this is the dabigatrin, which is the only oral agent for uh, directly inhibiting thrombin, which directly acts on the thrombin as the name implies. But we should know there are two uh, parenteral direct thrombin inhibitors, uh, which we don't use it much, but cardio uses. So that is one group. Uh, the second group is the drugs which binds directly to the activated factor 10. So these are the ones which you, uh, all of us commonly use, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban. So basically, it's very easy to remember, all of them ends with zaban, that is 10A ban meaning acting at activated uh, factor 10A, easy to remember. So this is the second uh, group of uh, drugs. Then we have the heparin group uh, where we have three subgroups of uh, heparin. So as you know, the heparin group mainly acts on antithrombin 3. So all of us have antithrombin 3 in our blood, uh, which keeps the blood from uh, preventing it from clotting too much. So what antithrombin 3 does is uh, it acts on both uh, <clears throat> activated 10A and thrombin. And it's a slow inactivator of both uh, factor 10A and uh, thrombin. So this is continuously working in our body to prevent uh, excessive clotting. So when you give heparin, what it does is it just combines with this uh, antithrombin, and once it combines with antithrombin, it potentiates the action of antithrombin many thousand times. So that's how heparin works. And uh, But there are three groups of heparin, and each has a slightly different mechanism. So when you give unfractionated heparin, it combines with antithrombin 3, and it preferentially inactivates more of thrombin than factor 10A. So that's the difference. Now, if you give low molecular weight heparin, again, it combines with antithrombin 3, but here the preferentially it inactivates more of uh, 10A. That's why we can check uh, factor 10A levels to monitor the action of uh, low molecular weight heparin. And uh, we use all these types of uh, low molecular weight heparin. Now, there are the third subgroup of heparin is called the heparinoids. And uh, here, the action is mainly on, only on factor 10A. So these are the three uh, heparinoids. Uh, uh, Fonda paranox is what we commonly use. 
and the specific indications for these heparinoids is uh, conditions where you cannot use other heparins like uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia vaccine induced uh, thrombosis etc so there are some some special uh, situations where you need to use heparinoids instead of the other two uh, heparins and finally we have the oral uh, vitamin k antagonist uh, which we all of us use uh, as cumarinol or and warfarin acitrom and warfarin which acts at multiple uh, sites uh, inhibiting the vitamin k dependent factors that is 2 7 9 and 10 so so these are the all the anticoagulants uh, we can use so first we will see who are the patients who will benefit uh with these agents following a stroke or a tia so so there are some very uh, high risk source of cardiac um, uh, sources of embolism that is one is uh, mechanical or prosthetic valve which goes without saying we have to use uh, these agents atrial fibrillation or sustained atrial flutter rheumatic heart disease and there is a thrombus in the uh, left atrium or uh, ventricle so these are very uh, defined indication there are some other indication which we may not be using it too much but we can use it one is a patient coming with a stroke or a tia following a myocardial infarction with a very low ejection fraction less than 30% or symptomatic heart failure patient is in symptomatic heart failure with a low ejection fraction ischemic cardiomyopathy who had a stroke and also patients with dilated cardiomyopathy who comes with a stroke or tia now apart from the cardiac condition there are other non cardiac conditions where we have to use uh, uh, anticoagulation one is uh, extracranial dissections uh, not all extracranial dissections we can use but there are some specific groups where these uh, agents will be useful second thing is a floating carotid thrombus non dissecting uh, uh, pathology causing a floating carotid thrombus or uh, aortic arch atheroma with a large thrombus antiphospholipid syndrome patient who has a stroke or tia due to a known underlying hypercoagulable state uh, vertebro basilar dolichoectasia is another uh, relatively new condition and cancer associated strokes so these are other conditions also are there other than cardiac so and also there are some special situations where you might need to Uh, combine anticoagulation and uh, antiplatelet agents uh, like a patient with a stroke who already had a stent done or patient with stroke having a, a pulmonary embolism etc so this this they are also uh, where you might have to combine antiplatelet and anticoagulants so before we start we should know where you cannot give uh, anticoagulants in a patient with stroke or tia so there are two absolute contraindication one is bacterial endocarditis uh, where you should not give because this will predispose to bleed and the second uh, absolute contraindication is atrial myxoma which can cause rarely cause strokes there also you cannot give the treatment here is surgery atrial myxoma so and also there are some other relative contraindications like uh, recent bleed uh, intracranial hemorrhage uh low bar bleeds where you suspect the patient to have amyloid angiopathy and uh, patient with a severe bleeding diastasis here you like to look at the nature of the uh, underlying cause and then take a decision severe thrombocytopenia uh, uh, the platelet like than 50000 is another contraindication and uh, any major trauma and here also you have to weigh the risk and benefit so these are all uh relative contraindication where still you might consider in a given patient with a very high risk of uh, recurrent stroke and also patient had a uh, invasive uh, uh procedure or obstructive procedure or patient with a intracranial uh, tumor or a spinal tumor or patient who has just undergone a uh, uh, epidural procedure patient with very high bp you have to wait for the bp to come down or uh, patient with aortic dissection so these are also relative contraindication you might wait for some time and then plan to start so coming to the first indication and this is the most common uh, indication where you start oral anticoagulation that is atrial fibrillation 
And uh, here, this is very important to preempt and start treatment here because uh, atrial fibrillation are associated with the uh, risk, high risk of stroke, almost five times the risk of stroke they have. And if they get stroke, it will be more disabling and more fatal and uh, compared to non cardiac embolic uh, uh, strokes. So basically, atrial fibrillation is a time bomb. If you have atrial fibrillation, you can have a stroke coming anytime. So whenever you see a patient with AF, with or without stroke, you have to assess how much is the risk of uh, stroke in that particular patient. So for this, we have the CHADS2 VAS score. So this is what you should use. Earlier, we had the CHADS score. So now it is modified. And this is the score, CHADS2 VAS score. So you have to look at the score in a bit detail. Uh, so you have patient with atrial fibrillation with congestive cardiac failure, scoring one, hypertension, and age is a very important factor here. The more older you are, the more score you get. More than 75 scores two. And female patients, one. So female with atrial fibrillation automatically get a score of one. Now, this is the unadjusted stroke risk. Uh, when you have AF, if you use the score, and uh, so a score of zero in males or one in females, you, know not, you need not start anything. But if you have a female with a score of two or a male with one, you can start. You can start. It's recommended, but it's not absolutely indicated that you should start. But females with a score of three, more than three, or males with two, then the benefit exceeds the bleeding risk. So this is how you should be using this scope. Now, there will be some patients you would have assessed the score and then you would have told, okay, score is not that great, we won't start. But make sure you reassess this patient periodically because see, if you look at the score, everything other than the patient sex can change and then put him, at a, or put him or her at a higher risk. So if you don't start, reassess periodically and then see whether at a later stage where the patient might uh, be falling into a high risk. So that is one thing. Now, the major why we hesitate to start is because of the bleeding risk with uh, these agents. So the bleeding can occur either intracranial bleed or GI bleed. So for this, there are a lot of scores we can look at this. Uh, one is the has blood score and uh, other there are other scoring like hemorrhage score and atria score. But uh, the score which has been well validated and studied in, especially in Asian population is the has blood score. And this is what we should use for our patient. And here also you have to look closely at this score because, uh, so the score has blood, that is the mnemonics for this, hypertension, abnormal renal or uh, liver function, S stands for stroke, previous stroke or TIA, previous bleeding and labile INR. And this is one important thing where your INR is fluctuating widely if you're using uh, uh, acetrome and age and medications. That is, uh, patient is concomitantly taking antiplatelets or uh, NSIDs or drinking more than uh, eight alcoholic drinks per week. So this is the has blood score. And anybody with a score of three, more, more than three is at a high risk of bleeding. Now, if you look at this score, there are a lot of things you can modify in this. So the main thing is drugs. So patient might be taking NSIDs over the counter, or you may be having aspirin also. Uh, you may be uh, binging alcohol. He may be a patient may not be very strictly following the INR and uh, INR may be fluctuating. And the most important thing is hypertension. So there, if you look at this score, before you start itself, we, there are so many things you can correct. And so if you have a patient with a high score, if you correct these some of these things, your score can actually become low or uh, almost normal. So this one thing we have to target before you start, you can even wait. If it's not something urgent, you can modify all these things, make the score less, and then start your anticoagulation. Now, another important thing which we often neglect and miss is the risk of falls. We don't ask this history in our patient. And uh, so you have to combine whatever scoring you are using along with the fall risk. 
because if a patient on oral anticoagulation has a fall, that will be the end of his story. So for this also, there are some certain scores and the most useful one can be the most false score. So very easy to use. And uh, any score of more than 45 is a very high risk for fall for that given patient. And so you can ask simple question, how you are walking in the house? Suppose the answer is that, uh, yeah, he walks holding on to ta tables and chairs. That means this chap is scoring 30 straight. Now with that, you combine uh, history of falls in the past, another 25 comes. So he's at a very high risk. So this patient, even if there is an indication, is better not to start because you'll be causing more harm than good. So this, this score also we have to consider or at least ask some history about falls or... Uh, so you can at least modify some, maybe there are some, uh, what do you call that, hazardous things inside the house, carpets, etc. You can tell the family that to be careful and make some modifications so patient don't fall while on anticoagulants. So, so the, the decision should be basically made using your risk and the risk of bleed and the benefit. So you have to use all these scores very judiciously and then take a decision, even if there is an indication for starting. Now, coming to the other indications. So, one important indication we saw was uh, history of cardiac uh, uh, thrombi or the patient having cardiac thrombi. So, you can have a patient coming with a stroke or TIA with a thrombi in multi any location. Like, most commonly we see it in the left atrium, left ventricle, Left ventricular thrombus is very common in uh, patients post-MI or patient with a cardiomyopathy. And you can even have a thrombus sitting on a mechanical or bioprosthetic valve or even on a lead, on a ICD lead. So these things has to be looked at carefully. And some of, uh, sometimes when you do a casual echo, you might miss it. And if there is a strong suspicion, you have to do other imaging like uh, MR, cardiac MR, etc. to pick up these uh, thrombus. So the latest re recommendation is you have to treat them with the oral anticoagulation and here you have to use warfarin, not any other oral anticoagulation for a minimum period of three months, reassess and then decide whether to uh, stop or not. So this is the latest uh, 2021 guidelines. But now what about... Uh, Do I has not been studied in this particular condition? Now, uh, what about a patient coming with a heart attack? So, patient had an MI less than three months and now he has come with a stroke and TIA. So, here also you can consider warfarin if the ejection fraction is less than 50 according to the new guidelines. Earlier it was less than 30. But here you can uh, give... So, most of the time you see that the echo will improve after the, after the immediate after the... Uh, my the ejection fraction may be low and another two months it might pick up. So till that time you can give uh, anticoagulation. This is also recommended in the newer guidelines. And But these patients, if they have a low ejection fraction, these are the subgroup where you might do a cardiac MRI with the low ejection fraction to pick up any uh, thrombus. So we, we uh, the studies one study we have just started is something called the stroke after myocardial infarction. So this is a study where neurology has taken the lead and uh, we had combined all the four cardiology units and we are following up all the stroke uh, all the patients with MI who are getting admitted over the next one year. So each patient will be followed up for one year and then see how many of them are getting uh, stroke or TIA. So already I think. Uh, we have some 600 patients on follow-up in the last three months. So very high turn. I mean, like the number of MIs is like every day three or four. Like so, at, maybe after two years we'll have some idea how many post MI strokes we are seeing. There's no data in India for this. So this uh, uh, fluid research has funded this trial and uh, it's an ongoing study. So the next indication can be a carotid free floating thrombus. So this is one of our patients. If you look at this, you see there is a large thrombus here waiting to break and uh, go up. It has caused some multiple small infarcts in the left MCA territory. So this is not a very common thing. And uh, the risk of uh, recurrence is very high, almost 17% in the 
first one month so so usually this this occurs once once when a carotid plaque ruptures when a carotid plaque ruptures you can have thrombus uh, emerging on the ruptured plaque and then moving up so there are two uh, methods to treat it Other, one is you can treat medically or you have to do endarterectomy and pull it out so here if you are not planning surgery you have to start anticoagulation and stabilize the thrombus the next is anti phospholipid antibody syndrome uh, this is a, another common uh, stroke we see but usually we over call these because we don't use the criteria often the separos revised classic uh, criteria is very important to follow where you have to repeat your uh, antibodies after 3 weeks and if it is uh, positive only then you can call it a anti phospholipid antibody syndrome and here if it it follows the criteria you can give oral anticoagulation if not fulfilling only antiplatelets an important thing here is if a patient has anti phospholipid antibody positive with all three antibodies positive rivaroxaban has been shown to be associated with increased thrombotic events for some unknown reason so it's better to avoid rivaroxaban so anti phospholipid only use warfarin i mean warfarin or acetrom don't go for noax now another indication is extra cranial dissections which is less than 3 months so sometimes you can get a dissection which has uh, dissected into the lumen and there is a thrombus sitting there so th th this patients also you can th the indication is you can either use double antiplatelets or warfarin to prevent recurrence of stroke now uh, cancer related strokes this is something new where you have to use uh, long term oral anticoagulants as you know can cancer can cause strokes in uh, multiple uh, ways one is the direct tumor you can have a metastasis and that itself can cause a stroke chemotherapeutic agents can also cause strokes and uh, long term effect of radiation suppose somebody had a, had a hydrogenic malignancy was received radiation 10 years back now you can have a carotid stenosis and that can cause stroke and the most common thing is coagulopathy so cancer can predispose to uh, thrombo uh, coagulopathy especially adenocarcinoma of the lung and this can cause stroke so whenever you have a patient who has a stroke and the stroke is in multiple arterial territories always always look for thrombosis in other vascular beds like pulmonary artery or even lower limb so if you have a patient like this you have to suspect uh, underlying uh, cancer related stroke and the d dimer is a very useful screening tool for this these patients will have d dimer more than 10 times the normal range and then uh, you have to start them on uh, systemic anticoagulation followed by oral anticoagulation till the act the malignancy has become inactive so earlier the recommendation was only to use uh, warfarin now you can use newer newer anticoagulants also for malignancy related strokes and uh, the last is dolichoectasia so dolichoectasia where you have the vessels especially in the posterior circulation will be dilated and these dilated vessels can cause strokes in multiple ways so usually this is seen with underlying uh, collagen disorders like ehler danlos marfens so there are multiple ways it can cause strokes one is direct compression on the brain stem and occlusion of the uh, or you can have a thrombus forming in the lumen of these uh, dilated vessels which can uh, cause strokes so all these mechanisms can stroke, cause stroke so but if the patient is already on antiplatelet and still getting strokes and uh, imaging showing any indication any signs of any thrombus sitting in one of these dilated arteries you can start anticoagulation for those patients aortic arch atheroma is another area where we often miss out a patient coming with a stroke without any other reason sorry without diabetic hypertension with a stroke where there is nothing else you have to closely look at the aortic arch and you might see a mobile thrombus sitting in the aortic arch which is thrown up the emboli or even if there is a no, there is no large thrombus uh, any any atheroma which is more than 4 mm can be considered as a etiology for that particular stroke there is nothing else anywhere else 
So here also there, uh, because this is not a very common uh, condition, there is a trial called the ARCH trial, which had compared uh, aspirin plus clopidogrel with warfarin. And uh, however, this was stopped because as I told you, this, uh, there was not many patients, but uh, whatever analysis, it was showing a trend towards warfarin with a good therapeutic range to uh, prevent further strokes. But if, if there is a patient with a large thrombus, this is one of our patients with the, you can see this thrombus here. It's almost two centimeter thrombus sitting here. It's already caused uh, one emboli in the thalamus and in the um, cerebellum and some MCA also is here. So if patients like this, definite indication for giving long-term anticoagulation, repeat the imaging and make sure it is fully resolved and then you can maybe put them on double antiplatelet acid. Another newer indication is something called uh, atrial cardiopathy. So sometimes uh, you'll have a patient with atrial fibrillation and uh, you have to look at this, uh, this is something new where there is a definite criteria which is being developed. Uh, and there is a study called the Ecardia study, which is going on to see whether this particular condition, anticoagulation, will be beneficial or not. So, so these are the patients where we have to consider starting cardiac and non-cardiac causes of uh, strokes or TIS. So the next question is what, what we can start for these uh, patients. So as we saw in the first few slides, we have a choice between oral anticoagulation, newer anticoagulation, heparin, heparinoids, etc. So the first we look at the warfarin because this has been there for almost 60 years now, well studied, well established uh, drug. And uh, there has been multiple studies looking at the efficacy of warfarin in stroke prevention. It is very, very effective. You can see here the if you the dose adjusted uh, reduction of uh, stroke risk is almost 64% compared with placebo. So there's no doubt that warfarin is working for preventing strokes and TIA in any of these indications. But the problem here is what you call as a TTR, that is time in therapeutic range. So if you look at this, this graph here, like, and th these are from studies where they've done trials on warfarin. So even under trial condition, when you when you're giving warfarin, it is achieving this time in therapeutic range only around 60% max, 65%. So the rest of the time, the patient is not protected, basically. So that is the main drawback of warfarin, what you call as the TTR. Now, so, the, so you're, you're having a window where the patient can have a stroke or TIA. Now, apart from this, there are other problems with warfarin. It's a narrow therapeutic range. The something more than that also is harmful and less than the, less than the INR is also not going to work and you need regular monitoring. And another thing is slow onset and offset. Like you start, it will work only, the therapeutic effect will come only after three, four days. And of course, no numerous uh, food and drug interaction. And of course, the risk of bleeding and especially intracranial bleed. So these are some of the uh, drawbacks of uh, giving warfarin. So that is why later on we had the newer anticoagulants which was working very well compared to uh, warfarin, which was found to be more efficacious, efficacious especially dabigatrin, 150 milligram and apixaban. If you look at this, it's very clearly uh, uh, showing more benefit than warf compared to warfarin in preventing strokes. But the if you look at the side effects of bleeding, and uh, here you have major bleeding and you have the GI bleed. The risk of GI bleed is slightly is definitely more with uh, compared to warfarin when you're giving newer, newer anticoagulants, especially dabigatrin at a higher dose is reaching almost like uh, odds of uh, 1.6 and uh, rivaroxaban. So, so you can use newer anticoagulation at the risk of having more of GI bleed. If you give warfarin, you're having a more of intracranial bleed. So if you ask anybody, they'll prefer to have a GI bleed than an intracranial bleed. So in that way, if you look at uh, newer anticoagulant, it, is, uh, it has an edge over warfarin. Especially if you're using dabigatrin at a lower dose, that is 110 BD, 
you have the same benefit as warfarin without much of side effects this slightly increase uh, risk of gi bleed in now what drug will you choose for your patients so it depends on some some smaller points now if you look at the absorption if you are giving the drug along with the protein pump uh, proton pump inhibitor if and if you are giving dabigatrin the efficacy comes down almost by 30% which is not there for dabigatrin and apixaban if you are giving dabigatrin you have to give it twice a day whereas uh, other two uh, rivaroxaban you can give it od with food and renal excretion is highest with dabigatrin and so the initially there was lot of hype that these drugs don't have any drug interaction but it's not so later on post marketing surveillance has shown definitely there are a lot of drug interaction especially to a neurologist that is very very important i'll just come to it uh, later so when you choose a drug patients with renal impairment you should not give dabigatrin and if there is mild or moderate uh, renal impairment you can give apixaban in a dose adjusted uh in a with a dose adjustment because apixaban and rivaroxaban as uh, your renal excretion is not that much especially with apixaban okay so that is one thing gi bleed or peptic ulcer disease in that patient is better to avoid newer anticoagulation because newer anticoagulation can cause more of gi bleed if you are using proton pump inhibitor again don't use dabigatrin but you can use either rivaroxaban or apixaban co prescription i think this is the most important thing here so there are drugs like mainly antivirals and uh, clarithromycin etc which can increase the efficacy of uh, newer anticoagulants and predispose to bleed and this is the these are agents where you don't have much to monitor like you don't usually monitor and finally they can land up with the bleed and for our, for us neurologists thrombosis you lo look at this all your anticonvulsants can potentially decrease the efficacy of your newer anticoagulants and predispose to thrombosis basically it doesn't work so and another important thing we should understand is if you are using these agents with a combination of levetiracetam or valproate especially any of these three dabigatrin apixaban or rivaroxaban has been shown to have much higher risk of causing a recurrent stroke or embolism so this also the reason is not very clear why these two agents can cause more of stroke when you combine with this agent so in effect any patient on anticonvulsant because these are the common drugs which all of us use it's better to avoid uh, new anticoagulants put them on acitrom and this is the most common thing which we always see with say cvt they have to have an anticonvulsant hemorrhage a stroke with the post stroke seizure so or we have to make sure that none of these drugs are on okay so that is very important from a neurology point of view so when you should not use newer anticoagulant other than this condition is mechanical heart valves you should not use because studies have shown they predispose to more valve thrombosis and valvular atrial fibrillation also you should not uh, use severe renal impairment we saw that if it is severe renal impairment even dose adjustment won't work or severe liver function pregnancy where low molecular weight heparin is uh, and co prescription of these other agents now there are some other areas where you might not use them uh, where you need to monitor the inr okay suppose somebody is very obese he is say 120 kilos and you are giving dabigatrin or apixaban that's a fixed dose like that's not meant for somebody who is 130 kilos where we don't know this drug may not be working so that, that the, those patients we might still prefer the older ones or patient on rt feeds we had recently a patient who under pmr i think where they were putting uh, dabigatrin they were taking the capsule and putting so that also won't work like so pec feeds rt feeds you cannot give hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis again because of the washout uh, drugs may not work and of course antiphospholipid syndrome we just saw that you should not give noax and of course the cost and uh, compliance so the another question is whether we should bridge 
So this is a common thing. Like patient comes with atrial fibrillation, stroke, your thrombolysis, everything. Patient is better. Now you are starting your uh, anticoagulation, whatever you want to start. So should you bridge with low molecular weight heparin or heparin and then start till the INR is? So the answer is no. You should not bridge because studies have shown that if you bridge, it increases the risk of bleed. Okay, so no bridging unless this is for atrial fibrillation, but for other conditions like carotid thrombus, left atrial thrombus, you can you can bridge. So. <clears throat> yeah, so only for atrial fibrillation, you need not bridge. Other, if there is no contraindication, you can bridge. What about switching oral anticoagulants? So if you want to, if your patient is on warfarin, you want to start them on OAX, it's very simple, just do an INR. INR is less than two, straight away you can start. It is between two, two, just around that range also. If you want, you can start, or next day you can start. If it is more than two, just wait, repeat it, Make it less than two and then start. So that is very simple. Warfarin to NOAX. What about patient you started? Patient comes with the left ventricular thrombus. Sorry, left ventricular thrombus, you can't start NOAX. Some other reason you start low molecular weight heparin and then you want to start NOAX for the malignancy related stroke. So you start NOAX uh, two hours before the next dose of your low molecular weight heparin. Okay. What about heparin infusion? Here it's very simple. You just stop the infusion and start your NOAX. Okay. And uh, similarly, when a patient is on NOAX, you want to switch over to warfarin, the other way around. So you stop the warfarin while the patient is still on NOAX. You start the NOAX and then check the INR every day and then. Okay. So the, the next question is when you should start. So that's a. Uh, so so this is a very common thing. You have a patient with a stroke and then uh, you this large infarct when you want to start. So basically this is a, uh, it's a rule we have, all of us follow. 1, 3, 6, 12. Okay. So if you have a minor stroke or a TIA, you can start the same day. Small infarct, you can start on day 3. Medium infarct, 6th six, six day. And large infarct, more than 12 days. Okay. You might even uh, push it further. So this is 13612 rule. So now how do you know whether the stroke is big, small and all that? You can use your NHS score. So anything uh, 1 to 4 is a minor stroke. And it's not only important to look at the NHS, look at your imaging also. So imaging shows a pristine CT without any problem. Start same day. Small infarct like this, you can start same day or wait for three days. Moderate stroke like this, you can wait for uh, four days to six days. You repeat the imaging, make sure there is no hemorrhagic conversion and then start. Large infarct, like a large MCA infarct, definitely you have to wait at least for 10 to 12 days. Repeat scan. So last two, definitely you need to repeat scan and then only start making sure there is no further, uh, no hemorrhagic uh, conversion. So this is uh, how you can uh, plan your anticoagulant following the stroke. So there's a new uh, score, not score, guidelines called the Samurai Non-Valvular AF uh, from two Japanese registries. Uh, this is mainly for use of newer anticoagulant following a stroke, when to start newer anticoagulant. So this is not yet uh, come, but uh, you, the, this has to be validated in patients and then only we can. Now, what about this scenario, your patient has come like this to casualty, very high BP. And uh, so basically as a bleed with an intraventricular extension, you do a routine e e ECG and it shows uh, AF. And now you are asking the patient history, he's saying, yeah, he had a stroke uh, in the past, he has fully recovered. And uh, you ch check his chats, VASC, it is very high. He is hypertensive, diabetic, 70. So when will you start oral anticoagulation? You, you need to start him on oral anticoagulation because he already had a, a earlier ischemic stroke and uh, he is in atrial fibrillation. So here you have to wait for at least one to two months. Okay, you wait for one to two months, and then so it's not very clear, but this is the general guidelines. And then repeat the scan and then restart. 
what about this patient patient has come to casualty similar patient with all the other risk factors af so this is a patient most probably he has amyloid angiopathy okay low bar hemorrhage so this is a patient where we should not start because he already has an amyloid angiopathy which will make him bleed again with or without an anticoagulation he is going to bleed if you give anticoagulation he is going to bleed more so this is a patient where you should not start unless there is very very compelling indication like patient already having a mechanical heart valve etc and you should be very very carefully monitoring your inr or whatever and uh, make sure you modify all risk factors like uh, hypertension everything to reduce your bleed risk so preferably not to start what about patients with mechanical prosthetic valve who comes with the ich so this patient you have to be on the other side you have to take the risk and start because here the risk the chance of having a stroke is very high more than four times hi higher than other other patients so here you have to take the risk and then uh, tell the family the risk and then plan starting as early as uh, possible uh, after repeating scan now patient you have started on warfarin he has come with the bleed okay so what will you do he, he, there is all indication for starting anticoagulation he got atrial fibrillation he had a stroke two strokes earlier so there is a study which was done from sweden so very interesting so if you look at this following a oral anticoagulant induced bleed the chance of having a recurrent hemorrhage is highest in the first 10 weeks and the chance of having a ischemic stroke is lowest in the first 10 weeks so the the thing is you should not give your anticoagulation for the first 10 weeks just leave him alone nothing is going to happen like you only if you give you are only going to increase the bleeding risk wait for 10 weeks and then start and make sure when you restart if there is no contraindication you start your newer anticoagulant because that is newer anticoagulant has less chance of intracranial bleed compared to uh, gi bleed okay so that is so what about a patient who has indication but there is absolute contraindication for starting both oral and any anticoagulant so what will you do patient has like the patient with the amyloid angiopathy if they can afford you can ask them to go for a left atrial appendage occlusion device like a watchman device there are newer devices now or you can ask them to go for a cardiac catheter ablation okay so these are the things where you can do even otherwise you can uh, other patients also you can advise this but if there is absolute contraindication you can suppose the patient has no money is very poor we cannot do all this what will you do can you will anti platelets work that's a question so this is an old study which was done in 2009 looking at the efficacy of uh, single versus double anti platelets in stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation so if you look at this study if you combine clopidogrel and aspirin there is definite benefit of 3.3% whatever there is benefit if you give only aspirin also there is a benefit of 2.4% risk reduction so but there is some slight bleeding risk also you should be aware of so if you don't have anything to do you can at least give anti platelet if patient you know that patient is not going to afford or uh, not uh, absolute contraindication for oral antibiotics so so before you start whatever you are starting you should be uh, talking in depth to the patient and family you should tell them this is a especially for atrial fibrillation that is a long term treatment and the cost will be a recurrence recurring cost about compliance monitoring diet complications you can call what's her name jendi sister and triveni is there they will explain all that so this is very very important because some of them thinks that oh you take this for two months and then stop and then they can have a recurrence so so practically very very important this is one of our patients uh, like you can see here he had a large carotid uh, like carotid block with a large stroke he came we did everything possible like he had a large penumbra he did mechanical and he was found to have a atrial fibrillation everything was done free and this is after 
two months he stopped all medication he is refusing to come to hospital and he is happy like so th- these are the practical things we face so so what we have to look at is cost effectiveness okay see earlier the newer anticoagulants were very costly like can't afford see right now, so if you if you are prescribing warfarin or acitrom you have to look at the direct medical cost that is the cost of the medicine itself testing non direct cost that is that he has to come to the hospital so he has to travel he has to eat maybe breakfast lunch in the somewhere in vellore and if he is coming from far off he might have to stay in the lodge and if he is coming with a caregiver who is working that chap is also losing his wages so you look at all the costs and see whether it is worth giving him acitrom or one of the newer anticoagulants when you prescribe so so basically you can take your decision like this you have the drugs with very high cost here and very low cost no benefit and maximum benefit if you look at your warfarin it will be somewhere here it is not much it's not a very costly medication but if your time in therapeutic range is low then your benefit is going low so you should strive to increase your uh, ttr to make it a uh, at a max, give it maximum benefit the warfarin if a patient can afford then you can give newer anticoagulant and if you don't have i mean like nothing you know that this chap is never going to come back like that patient we had at least give him double antiplatelet let him some benefit you will get okay so basically uh, i would conclude by saying that there are conditions other than atrial fibrillation which needs anticoagulation and some of them we can stop it after some time and each patient we have to tailor okay it's not like uniform we can uh, say that you can take this and this chad swas can has split scope is very 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 important because you have to look at those risk and modify those risk it's not that just using the score they, these are meant for modifying the risk and then treating the patient and also rescoring okay and always look at the cost effectiveness okay when you prescribe thanks medicine department no they can ask some questions hey yeah tell this prophylactic dose anticoagulation what do you think it's uh, so when the patient is in the when the patient is in the hospital yeah that is uh, that for dvt prophylaxis say a patient comes with an acute ischemic stroke standard treatment will be antiplatelets instead of antiplatelets instead of antiplatelets if you use once daily mixing no the bleeding risk is less and uh, efficacy wise it may be not there <laughs> no but the only thing is that the, the mechanism of action no suppose you have an atherosclerosis you need antiplatelet action there so the you are giving low molecular weight heparin for dvt prophylaxis okay. where the mechanism of action is different yeah from uh, atheroma to prevent so so you need to have both pathologically yeah but clinical efficacy i don't know because it seems like any way to prevent any further problem see if you look at it the only drug which can have both the action is uh, direct thrombin inhibitor because if we give direct thrombin inhibitor there is some antiplatelet action also because one of the mechanisms of triggering platelets is thrombin thrombin can uh, sure. activate platelets so you are giving thrombin inhibitors direct dti both for VA. so that is only drug which can have both action i think the international stroke trial and all the patients had less thrombotic events yeah. but there are a lot of bleeds. bleeds that's why it was not a bad thing but i think there is some trials like uh, they use dvt prophylaxis low molecular weight heparin in stroke those patients did very well even after 5 uh, 6 months 7 yeah. months so, so the action was supposed to be the low molecular weight sub, 
was helping the stroke as well. And that was the stroke yeah. as well. That was the early trials with uh, low molecular yeah, heparin. Low molecular. And that time, pe- people who started using low molecular heparin as a treatment for stroke uh-huh. for, for around five, six years. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, did anyone do studying low molecular weight rather than relatively <laughs> dose as an alternative to aspirin? No, alternate to aspirin, I'm not sure, but yeah, this was there earlier. Uh, treatment with low molecular heparin in the acute phase. From medicine, any anybody has any questions? Okay. Huh? Role of ah uh, yeah, role of anticoagulation in posterior circulation or. Brainstem strokes. Yeah. So, so there is no no difference in the role of. Uh, see, earlier I like used to so have a patient with a posterior circulation. Used to start them on anticoagulation and all that. So there is no real role like that. Uh, you can so any large artery uh, atherosclerotic disease. You need to give double antiplatelet agents for at least for 21 days to three months. So if you have a basal artery thrombosis and stroke, you can give antiplatelets. Unless on the CT angio, you're seeing a, there is a vertebral artery thrombus, which is protruding into the basal artery and causing a artery to artery embolic stroke. That it can be an indication for putting them on anti, oral anticoagulation for a short period, maybe three to six months. Repeat the imaging and make sure the thrombus is fully resolved. Then then switch back to uh, antiplatelet agents. So that is that is the only indication in posterior circulation strokes, like in anterior circulation. Any anywhere you see thrombus, you can start anticoagulation. Okay. 